Okay. Uh, dear friends, welcome to this uh, Friends of Multilateralism group session on trade and climate change. Uh, you know, uh, FMG, the Friends of Multilateralism, is a think tank in, based in Geneva, but with friends all over the world, focusing on WTO and uh, its reform. Of course, the issue between trade and, and climate change is always an issue. We are following closely. We have done a few sessions on CBAM, climate change, and other things. And we, this is remains to dear, uh, dear to the group and uh, its members. And we know that uh, as DG, Director General of the WTO, Dr. Nicosi, said earlier this year that trade and trade policy uh, must act uh, as a catalyst uh, for the transformation, uh, transformation of how uh, we, we mean all the people produce, consume, and live if human, uh, human uh, kind is really to, uh, is to successfully overcome the impact of uh, climate change. Uh, and uh, I would like uh, probably first want to thank Alejandro uh, and uh, for bringing the group together and uh, letting us know that he <coughs> and uh, the friends who are going to speak has done an excellent session in Daluar on this issue. Uh, and then before I give the floor to Alejandro, who is going to kindly moderate this session, uh, just a quick word to the group that we have expanded uh, with three new uh, friends, uh, Nakatomi-san from Japan, uh, Fernando from uh, Me Mexico, and Tatiana from Brazil. Uh, so Nakatomi-san and Fernando are today with us. So a big welcome. So with that, uh, I give floor to Alejandro, please. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lou, and uh, good morning, good evening, uh, good afternoon to you all, wherever you are. I was recently very privileged and honored. I was invited to this workshop in Talwar on climate change and trade, organized by Yale, Dan Esty, and Joel Trachtman, uh, Fletcher, and Janice, with her think tank in the uh, in the Caribbean. I always a difficulty pronouncing its name, sorry, Jenny. But, uh, uh, and, and I was really privileged to, to listen to a, a discussion amongst the different stakeholders, NGOs, friends from the Secretariat, Holim was there, Ben Nezouk, uh, Gabriel Marceau, amongst others, and, um, and, uh, also people from the, the, the academia and, and some people from governments as well. We had a, a very intensive and good discussion, which I will not refer to, uh, because that would be up to the, um, to Dan and, and Joel to, just, and, and, and Janice to say something. And we have also have today as one of, uh, our speakers, uh, Holim, you all have the, um, bio in the in the program that was distributed, so I will not introduce them, but with and without further ado, let me first give the floor to Dan, uh to whom I, I and, and to whom I once more I thank very much for the uh, invitation extended to me to participate in the in the workshop. And I know that Dan will have to leave uh at ten. So let's make uh Best use of his time. Yeah. So, Alejandro, thank you, uh, and thank you all for taking time out of your busy days to be part of a conversation. I, I do want to see if Ho Lim wants to just start us out and set the stage. Um, what I was proposing to do would be to tell you a little bit about the Remaking Global Trade for a Sustainable Future project that um, has been launched by Yale University, uh, the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts with Joel Trackman, and the University of the West Indies with Jean-Yves Remy. Um, but I don't know whether, Ho, you would like to start and just set the broader context of sort of um, how it is um, that the uh, trading system is uh, suddenly got uh, sustainability front and center uh, and the Trade and Environment Division working double time to uh, keep up with the issues that are being uh, developed and uh, and being pushed forward. 
Yeah, sure. Thanks, Dan. Uh, um, you know, this is a really nice conversation among friends and, and old colleagues. Um, so let me just kick off very quickly with a few thoughts. I mean, firstly, it's very good to, to partner with uh, Yale and Tufts. They can afford a retreat like Talwa. WTO Secretary barely able to buy coffee. So it's been great to, to work with, uh, with the two universities. Um, you know, uh, what I, I think, you know, th this this particular, well, answering your question, where, where does all of this come from? I, I think first thing to recognize is not new. I mean, it's been with us for quite some time. Uh, trade, sustainability, climate change and environment uh, dating back to, you know, even at the beginning of the Uruguay round. Um, what is different perhaps is the urgency and, and what is perhaps different is also the um, I, I would say at least the, the wider societal move, uh, which, which also involves, of course, those in trade and, and in trade policy. And, and what do I mean by wider societal move is that, of course, I've just been coming from listening to a a, a webinar organized by the UK um, on environmental goods and services. One of the speakers on, on the webinar uh, from Singapore, um, uh, she made, I think, a really, you know, private sector speaker made some really interesting points. I mean, her, uh, her first point was basically that, you know, um, in Asia, for instance, or in Singapore, more particularly, the, the population is very young. Um, the majority are below 35 years old. Uh, amongst this very young generation, uh, all issues, green and green consumerism, uh, makes a difference to them in their in their choices, and both uh, in terms of things they buy and more in terms of lifestyle. And she, coming from the private sector, they they are fully conscious of this, and they are already aligning themselves uh, to what this movement, uh, which is essentially the way she puts it, is now a mainstream movement. It's not a niche movement. It's not about a small group of environmental goods and services is about the wider shift of everything uh, being looked at through this lens of sustainability. Now, has this movement really managed to change things at WTO? Of course, we know that it's not yet there. I mean, the, the, the processes in WTO are different. It's not a private sector type organization as such, but some of these trends will, of course, also affect the way uh, governments respond, be it positively or sometimes negatively, or sometimes just unsure about the way forward. Um, so in that sense, I, I think there's an opportunity to be thinking more widely about trade and sustainability, um, looking at it not necessarily always with our traditional lens of like um, WTO rules and WTO uh, principles uh, versus environmental principles, even though that is still going to be a big part of the conversation but also looking at what does it mean in terms of pathways uh, for trade and development or trade and sustainable development uh, using trade tools or even integrating some of these considerations into uh, countries' own strategies um, uh, on the trade and environment front. And then I think that the last one, and uh, it goes without saying, of course, uh, uh, from day one, uh, the DG, uh, Dr. Ngozi, has been stressing this point. I mean, it's, it's not uh, new to any of you. She made it a very clear message from her uh, that under her own personal leadership, the importance of uh, uh, sustainable trade or trade in climate or trade in environment, whichever way you want you want to put it. Um, is it an easy challenge uh, or easy opportunity? Uh, no, I mean, it's not easy because uh, WTO, uh, one could say, has three broad paradigms that, that have been with the system. I mean, one, a fairly defensive one in the early parts about this organization is about trade, not about environment. We don't deal with environment here. Uh, this is very much a trade or environment type paradigm. Then you have the more sort of trade and environment paradigm that, you know, there is a way to mutually reconcile both, that uh, trade policy on the one hand, environmental policy on the other hand, need not necessarily uh, clash. They can be mutually supportive, and we should try to aim for win-wins, which is the, I, I would call it the, the post-Uruguay round type uh, uh, agenda through the Committee on Trade and Environment. And then lastly, uh, you know, we're now at an, another type of uh, discussion, a frontier, uh, which is more trade uh, for environment. Can we go beyond trade and environment? And what is trade for environment? Why is it complicated? Well, because I think if you take a poll of, of our membership, 
uh, I think you will find that there's still going to be different views amongst all of these three caricatures that I, I created. I mean, they're prob probably much more complex than what I said, but I think there will still be these positions amongst the membership. So uh, that makes this a very uh, both exciting and, and difficult way forward. Now, I'll stop there. Already said too much, probably, and I'll pass on to Dan, which I think has got some very clear ideas as to how trade can be more trade for environment. So thanks. I hope that was helpful. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, and I will pick up where you left off and uh, and also just say uh, thanks to some of you who've uh, been helping me think through these issues now over three decades. As I've been joking, um, now that I'm in Geneva uh, and based with uh, Ho for the year, um, I, I like to say I, I reread my 1994 book, Greening the Gat, on the way to joining Ho and his team. And there's good news uh, and bad news with regard to that. The good news is so much of that book is still relevant. The bad news is so much of that book is still relevant, uh, which is to say that um, some of the critical questions have been addressed, but others have not. And there really is, I think, new pressure, as Ho has just outlined, to think about um, what I call the sustainability imperative in the context of the trading system. And what I mean by that is that in the last uh, decade, for sure, and even perhaps more recently, the world community has advanced the sustainable development goals, the 17 goals the UN uh, endorsed in 2015. And in that same year, of course, was the Paris Agreement uh, on Climate Change. And more recently, the Glasgow Climate Pact of last year, which sharpens the focus on moving society across the world to net zero greenhouse gas emissions uh, by 2050. And uh, that is the backdrop to the project that Joel and I launched and Janiv has joined us uh, in advancing, which was to say, how does the trading system respond to these other efforts? Uh, what's going on uh, in the broader environment world, uh, particularly this world of sustainability? And uh, that was the impetus behind uh, this launch of our Remaking Global Trade for a Sustainable Future project. And that project um, has uh, really set out with a, a mission for asking uh, questions around when trade and sustainability connect, um, how do we reconcile them? How do we get them to uh, fulfill Ho's perhaps third vision, which is alignment, um, where the trading system is seen as not just stepping back from and creating space for environmental policy, but perhaps even helping to advance action on climate change in particular, sustainability more broadly. And frankly, how do we ensure that the efforts to advance the environment agenda, which as several of you have now said is, is being taken up with added urgency in recent years, how do we make sure that doesn't come at the expense of the trading system and uh, the opportunities that creates for development across the world? So that's our starting point. And um, the vision of this project was to bring together key people to discuss on a quite focused basis uh, the critical touch points where trade and sustainability uh, connect or intersect, and there may be tensions that have to be addressed or, or opportunities to uh, produce alignment and move the agendas uh, that are in parallel together forward. And uh, Joel's going to talk in a few minutes, uh, and Johnny will provide additional commentary on the first of the workshops that we uh, organized, which uh, took place, as some of you have just heard, uh, in Taloir, France, a few weeks ago, focused on trade and climate change. But our goal is to go beyond that and really look broadly at the sustainability agenda out over the next year, thinking about uh, sustainable agriculture uh, and the issues related to that, including questions uh, around what leads to unsustainable agriculture, whether that be uh, water concerns or worries about biodiversity, uh, or about the kind of farming that's done and the kind of ranching that's done, uh, and frankly, about subsidies that might distort the trade. So that's a, an agenda we've got in mind. Uh, we're also interested in sustainable transportation. How does shipping, how does uh, aviation get in line with the goal of net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050? And we also know there's a, a very substantial group of countries concerned about uh, waste and recycling and reuse and recapture of materials. Uh, a, a very focused effort around plastics has emerged, but more broadly, this is really an issue of a circular economy. 
which is probably the ultimate uh, element of a sustainable economic future. We also are very clear, uh, as you've already heard, that there is going to need to be some flow of investment, particularly to the global south, to ensure that the push towards a, a sustainable future, towards a sustainable economy, particularly one underpinned by low carbon power, uh, gets to go forward. We're going to need a lot of new sources of capital to ensure, as the, as the frame now has it, a just transition to a low carbon future. And so that's very much on our mind. And we also are, are thinking about the social dimensions of sustainability, uh, public health cooperation, uh, issues around labor and workers, uh, gender questions. So we're going to try to pick up all of these issues uh, in workshops out over the coming months. And the goal would be at the end of the year to attempt to distill out uh, some set of observations or conclusions, uh, perhaps amounting to, but maybe not, uh, a sustainability uh, uh, agenda for the World Trade Organization or the sustainability trade world more broadly. And so I think we're in the midst of a learning process now. Uh, each workshop has um, got a structure that we think is working pretty well, which is to invite s several thought leaders to produce white papers as background to a conversation. Uh, Joel will tell you about those in the trade and climate change context in just a minute. And we use those white papers to kind of sharpen thinking, uh, highlight critical questions, propose pathways forward, and again, to set up a discussion that we hope will allow us to distill out over time as people think these issues through uh, in mixed groups. Um, our, our, our workshops include thought leaders from across North and South, from people that are environmentally minded or sustainability focused, as well as those that are trade experts. Uh, people from business, people from NGO communities, from uh, uh, foundations, uh, really from across the spectrum. And the hope is with that group gathering and thinking intensively over the course of uh, two and a half or three days that we get uh, some insights on how to make this agenda come together and move. So I, I want to just close by saying uh, first thank you to Ho for allowing me to join uh, uh, as an affiliate of his team at the WTO for the year, it's uh, opened my eyes to a lot of the complexity and the nuances that it's hard to get as a professor sitting uh, uh, 5,000 kilometers away. And um, I feel like I'm learning a tremendous amount. And um, I'm eager uh, over the course of the year to continue to learn with the thought that this uh, allows me over time to be a more effective uh, thinker about how trade and sustainability will be woven together uh, in the years ahead. So with that, let me pause. I'm happy to answer questions about this uh, after Joel gives us, uh, with jean Eve's commentary, a little bit of a review of what we did uh, in Talawar in terms of this trade and climate change conversation. So Joel, over to you. Thank you. Um, thanks also to Alejandro Hara and uh, Shan Kun Lu and uh, to all of these uh, members of the Friends of Multilateralism. Uh, we're, we're looking forward to uh, your advice during this session and separately. And, and let me also thank Dan and uh, Jani for their, their leadership on this project, which has been wonderful. So I, I want to drill down into uh, what we learned at this Talwar workshop, what, what insights at least I took away from the workshop. Um, and uh, then I'll, I'll say a little bit about what this raises, uh, what the, these ideas raise for multilateralism and, and the WTO more broadly. So first on, on border carbon adjustments and uh, carbon clubs, which are uh, very much related issues. Uh, one of the insights was that uh, interoperability is critical for border, border carbon adjustments and is highly technical and, and probably should not be determined unilaterally. Uh, perhaps a joint expert working group uh, involving the WTO and the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change uh, would be a, a way to proceed on that. Uh, border carbon adjustments and climate clubs without some accommodation for developing countries uh, seems inconsistent with the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities. And um, the, the the idea that came across at our uh, at our workshop was that accommodation uh, should probably take the form of some kind of rebates of charges for carbon reduction and adaptation uh, for developing countries 
rather than uh, a reduced carbon price. Uh, third, uh, sustainability negotiations like these, and this is a general point, may have a, a different dynamic from the traditional trade negotiations. Uh, and so one uh, commentator raised the question, is membership in a climate club attractive or unattractive? Are inducements really needed? Uh, and that, uh, you know, asks the question, what is the structure of this game? What are the payoffs? What is going on here? And, and certainly the climate change and carbon adjustments game is a different one from the tariff reduction game. And, and we need to readjust our negotiations accordingly. Um, on green goods, uh, also, there's a great need for technical support, cooperation with other international organizations with different expertises than that of the WTO. Uh, probably a need to focus on some calculation of probable environmental effect uh, to reduce mercantilism in the negotiations that would require expert information. Uh, and, of course, a critical mass is needed to avoid free riding um, in, uh, under MFN in green goods. Here, there's a possibility to harness green goods trade to uh, achievement of nationally determined contributions. Um, and uh, one idea proposed was to try to include natural goods to provide a regime that also benefits uh, developing country exports. Uh, on foss fossil fuel subsidies like fisheries, uh, it's interesting, and, and this goes to Ho's point, uh, this is more sustainability than trade, and, and here's the WTO being harnessed for uh, a sustainability issue. Uh, again, uh, technical data, cross-disciplinary, cross-international organization work is needed involving the IMF, the International Energy Agency, the OECD. Uh, as well as the, the WTO and others. Uh, here, there might be a possible plurilateral agreement with critical mass among the main uh, subsidizers. Uh, finally, on, on renewables subsidies, uh, obviously they may be actionable or countervailable under the current regime. And, and the idea here was to negotiate for an exemption, conditional perhaps on proportionality to climate effects, possibly with uh, multilateral review, either in advance or, or subsequently. So uh, what does this add up to? Uh, I think it adds up to significant normative work to uh, establish interoperability of border carbon adjustments, to establish a regime for developing country rebates, on border carbon adjustments to continue negotiations on green goods, including natural goods, towards uh, either an MFN or a critical mass agreement, to accelerate negotiations for fossil fuel subsidies reduction on a plurilateral basis, perhaps, uh, to um, and, and you might think of these things as forming the core of a sustainability package or a sustainability round that might uh, achieve this goal, as uh, as Ho and Dan have been suggesting, of uh, the. Oops, yes. Joel is frozen as was suggested about linkages to just transition issues, including climate financing. So uh, a lot of significant technical and organizational work. So, so what does this raise for multilateralism and the WTO generally? As, as Ho suggested, in the past, the GATT and the WTO abstained from non-trade issues, uh, and that, in a sense, was a departure from the, the International Trade Organization, the organization that was never completed. And I remember 15 or 20 years ago talking to um, Jagdish Bhagwati and, and Tian Srinivasan, and, and they were very happy to keep other issues out of the WTO, uh, out, out of the GATT uh, at that time and then the WTO, because they felt that um, tariff reduction was a win-win uh, game and, and they were worried about other types of issues. Uh, but that abstention was never complete. We had the Article 20 ex exceptions. Uh, with the WTO, we had the TRIPS, the SPS, and TPT that brought in norms from other uh, areas, and, and recently the fisheries negotiations. 
So what's wrong with abstention? I think first, public relations, uh, a sense of prioritization of commerce over regulation. Uh, I, I think one of the ways to understand this early abstention is uh, as a temporally sequenced history of cooperation, uh, like the United States with our commerce clause, like the European Union with their single market. Commerce comes first and, and regulation has to follow. Um, so this was okay before there were increased pecuniary externalities uh, related to trade, concerns regarding effects on wages of, wages of the poor uh, with the rise of China, and ordinary externalities less related to trade like climate change. Um, and uh, this uh, raises the question of the benefits of linkage. And here I think it's important to say that the inability to fu negotiate fully without linkage um, is uh, is a problem today, and, and Dan's colleague uh, Bill Nordhaus at, at Yale, you know, suggested climate clubs. We might not like the idea of, of his proposal, uh, but we can say that that idea of linkage uh, to try to negotiate further, to try to induce change, where not every change is desirable to every party, um, has some, has some merit to consider. Uh, linkage is also a way to compensate developing countries for the cost of transition and adaptation through um, uh, a virtuous bargain of increased liberalization in exchange for climate action, uh, like the uh, example of climate finance or, or the trade facilitation agreement. So um, linkage uh, of the kind, I think this discussion indicates happens in integrated negotiations, not one-off negotiations. Um, and uh, those integrated negotiations require integrated expertise from national governments uh, and mandates, integrated mandates from national governments, uh, as well as uh, integrated uh, operation of international organizations. So, so it raises the question, how will all of the multiple international organizations of which you are well aware that are acting on climate change uh, organize themselves for integrated negotiations? What are the best practices in this area? So it's an interesting set of bargaining problems with more complex linkage of multiple types of negotiation games with different strategic structures. Um, tariff reduction negotiations, uh, we can be nostalgic for those. They were relatively simple. Uh, climate involves uh, global public goods with, with a different bargaining dynamic. It doesn't mean everyone is going to reduce carbon autonomously, but, but it is a different bargaining dynamic. Uh, and some, some global goods are like the ozone treaty where individual payoffs from compliance are positive. So dominant, the dominant strategy is compliance, but, but others uh, are not. So I think these raise uh, important questions for multilateralism, for the coherence of uh, different organizations and different mandates in this uh, in this problem solving era. And uh, I hope that uh, this group can help us think about those. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Jenny, you call him? Jenny, Jenny. Yeah, yeah. Dan, go ahead. I was just going to invite Jenny, who uh, yeah. is our policy director for this program, to add her perspective. Hello, thank you so much. I hadn't planned on speaking because I was I was in the, this group a couple of weeks ago, and I, I I don't I don't want to be uh, overexposed. But because this topic is so important, just a couple of things um, as policy director, thinking about uh, this as a movement, and it's not necessarily something. Um, that Dan, Joel, and I have um, sort of set in stone. But I think coming out of Talwar, we do have some very strong ideas about the things that really were effective. And so I just want to get, spend two minutes thinking about process. Because one of the things that has revealed itself clearly, to me anyway, is how much is happening in this space. And I think for our project um, to be more inclusive, sustainable, and ultimately effective, um, you know, we've been, and I know Dan has been really, really, um, you know, very, very prolific and very present in the networking space. We really do need to bring as many people into the fold to uh, maintain dynamism and traction, but we also have to be really, really sort of uh, targeted in the way that we, you know, put our agenda forward. And just a couple of things that have come up 
at least for me, um, is one, this whole area of, I mean, Joel talked about fragmentation. There's fragmentation in the broader sense also of how, you know, how do we involve the WTO in a broader conversation with all of these international organizations with overlapping and interlocking regimes? So not just climate change, but finance, um, you know, fisheries was an example of how we do that effectively, but also reaching out across the divide to the private sector and thinking of what, what role the WTO plays. Is it going to kind of get its rules enmeshed uh, very, very closely with these other regimes? Is it going to provide a forum for discussions where its competence may not be strongest, at least hitherto, um, in these fields? So I think one of the conceptual issues we would really appreciate a feedback on is how, how does the WTO become and remain relevant uh, without necessarily spreading itself uh, too thin? I think a second issue that came up from Tawa is real effective uh, representation by the Global South. I think we had such great, uh, not just notional, because sometimes people can think having uh, all of this representation, geographic spread is a, a box ticking exercise, and it was nothing like that. I think the energy, the enthusiasm, the ideas, uh, the real willingness to be part of the solution and not be uh, you know, invited along just as I mentioned, just because it's the right thing to do, but also the global south and the ambassadors and the technical staff, they played a huge role in helping us think along and across the different dimensions of this issue. So how do we link climate change with biodiversity? How do we think about that in terms of the blue economy? How do we think offensively about how developing countries can take the lead, not just in terms of advocacy, but also thinking about how to adapt the rules. And I think the Global South is going to play a huge role in this. Um, and that's going to be reflected in the way we even organize um, our work and our events. So, so look out for that. And, and then just in terms also of um, forward movement, not singularly in the context of thinking uh, about uh, the participation of, of governments and states. But also, you know, we're all in our own sort of ways, members of civil society. I think one of the really important lessons from climate change so far has been to make sure that it's bottom up and top down, that we're, we're organizing among those entities like this one and getting them to feel part of the solution in ways that, you know, maybe we haven't before. So how does the global, how, how do we in, in, in invite and make sure that civil society seems very much part of this process? And so again, our workshop is reflective of that as a model in making sure academia is present, making sure these white papers get chewed on and, and debated and then ultimately will form part of a broader sort of academic piece, but also one that is informed by very practical solutions and practical ideas moving forward. So I think, uh, you know, we have a huge task um, to move forward, as I mentioned, but also to be inclusive, but also make sure that we're targeted and we're effective and getting everything uh, done and completed while at the same time uh, making sure that the boat uh, brings everyone along with us. So thanks for the opportunity, and we really look forward to ideas, feedback on how to make sure that we do this effectively in a very, very short space of time. So thanks for the opportunity. Oh. Thank you very much, uh, Janice and, and Joe and, and Dan, for your remarks and all the descriptions of, of the questions that were raised and the areas and issues that were touched upon and the uh, forward thinking of, of, of Janice. I will start by saying, um, Ho Lin said that this is not new, but what is new is the urgency. And it, this all comes at a time when let me put this in, in, in a wider context when the multilateral trading system is undergoing probably its worst crisis since its creation in 1947. And there is wide agreement that there should be a reform of the multilateral trading system and steps have been taken in that direction. Um, perhaps not as, as, as urgent as required. But it's part of a, a political process that it, it's going on in Geneva and, and in capital, the reform of the WTO. WTO. Now, and the, and the mindset, I like very much what Ho Lin said, it's going from 
or trade an environment to trade for environment. I think that that is that is, that is very important. And and the question of alignment, as as Dan said, uh, becomes very important. In in my mind, the real question becomes: How is the multilateral trading system going to adapt to the requirements of climate change, uh, and and, and not seek uh, the alignment of the environment to the trading system? That would simply not make sense. Uh, so. As far as possible, of course, as Dan said, this alignment should not be at the expense of the multilateral trading system. But what is the multilateral trading system when there's a, a process of reform it, it initiated at the very beginning, first steps? And, and we have now, let me take one point, for example, the carbon border adjustment mechanism. It's not something that will take that is maybe with the theory. It's, it's already taking place. It's at the doorstep. So how are we going to face that? It, it, what, what is going to be the international cooperation? Uh, will this be a confrontational or will this, will there be cooperation in order to, uh, be, uh, to have these measures taken and that there be uh, no negative impact? In terms of the function or the objectives of the system, discrimination, non-discrimination, and liberalization of trade, goods, and services. And, and, and to me, that, 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 that the carbon border just a mechanism is just one of the main issues that has to be faced with urgency and outside of the reform of the multilateral trading system because the reform is going to take much, much longer. This is a question now here and now. And all of these uh, take up a lot of political energy. energy. Uh, in the past, uh, goods, uh, 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 an environmental goods agreement was, was not possible. Um, we still have more than half, maybe three quarters of, 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 of job to be done in terms of fishery subsidies still pending. And so on. And, and, and as Joe had mentioned, there's some intractable, uh, some very important issues in terms of subsidies, fuel fossils, uh, fuel subsidies, renewable subsidies, and so on. And I put that in the wider context of this quite intractable problem that the multi data trading system has to face with its, uh, less than good disciplines on, on subsidies overall. And some mention was also made of the developing countries and what accommodation, compensation, and so on. Uh, and the question poses itself, as my former boss, as Kambami would say, when you're dealing with um, with issues that are in the real of uh, precaution, there's very little room, if at all, for uh, preferential treatment. It, it becomes very... There's no such thing as a developing emission of carbon as opposed to a developed emission of carbon and so on. It's all emissions of carbon is that what we have to face and we have to do it now. So with that and taking into account that Dan it should leave by 10, maybe it should like the audience to raise uh, issues, ask questions, take advantage of his presence here. The floor is open. Lou, you raise your hand. Yeah, thank you, Alex, and uh, a lot of thanks to all the uh, four speakers for the great insights. I mean, it brings a lot of information uh, into the uh, discussion of our group. Uh, one thing I, I remember very much uh, out of uh, interest in knowing always is that uh, uh, that uh, with all the different, uh, I'll say, uh, ideas and all the kind of things we're going to do uh, to, to link trade policy and climate change, uh, there's always an uh, issue, as some of you have touched upon, about the, 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 the Great South, uh, so a kind of a di uh, developmental aspect. Uh, the reason I, I mention this now is because not only because this issue is important, but also today, uh, 
uh, in the audience, we do have a few ambassadors and uh, de delegates uh, from from uh, uh, missions of uh, Cabo Verde, Maidiv, Djibouti, and Ma uh, Malawi. So, so I think that, uh, uh, especially for the WTO multilateral trading system, uh, a lot of things are now, including many people talking about climate change and other things like uh, fossil uh, subsidy, fishery, uh, not fisheries, but others. It's very much going forward plurilateral. We see uh, little, if none, participation by the Great South, especially the LDCs. Uh, so purely looking into the narrow lens of the multilateral trading system on the issue of trade and trade policy and climate change. I mean, we do need more uh, 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 reflection about how to engage with the South. I mean, some of you talk about uh, compensation for transition, more technical system, more uh, correct information, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, but uh, probably that, that's not uh, uh, enough. I think that we, we, how we proactively engage the South will be a key issue on, uh, on how we are going to successfully or effectively uh, link the two issues together and to move the way uh, forward. Otherwise, we will be seen as somehow transiting to more greener, uh, strategy, but uh, the Great South will be falling behind or repeating what the more powerful countries have been doing in the past decades. So that's just a general question to all the three, uh, all the four speakers. If any more detailed thoughts could be shared, it would be great. Thank you very much. So let me offer just a few quick thoughts um, in the spirit of a back and forth, but I, I very much uh, hope uh, we can take up the question of what it would require to get full participation from the global south in this conversation, which I think is a fundamental issue and critical of the agenda. But here are the two thoughts um, that I just wanted to put in front of you all. First, um, I think, and Joel mentioned this briefly, that one of the things that we need to think about together, and again, I'd benefit from the wisdom of those of you in, in this call, uh, is the need to move from a traditional model of negotiation that was designed around tariffs and uh, and traditional you know exchange of concessions, which works um, when the goal is tariff reductions and there's sort of tit for tat bargaining that makes sense. Um, but that's a, a zero sum structure of negotiation in some ways, and in uh, many regards is seen at least by those of us looking at this from the conceptual point of view as not well suited to negotiations that aim to produce global public goods, like um, action on climate change, where uh, we're not in a zero sum game. And to the contrary, um, your failure is my failure. So we really need to figure out how to get people moving together uh, on bringing down greenhouse gas emissions. So I think fundamentally, the uh, global South has a huge stake in um, bringing sustainability broadly, but climate change in particular into the framework, the core framework of the trade world, the trade regime. And I think, and this is point two, what I have heard and now my couple of months in Geneva is a, a growing base of interest in that uh, sort of rethinking of the trading system for a sustainable future, recognizing that developing countries are most at risk if we don't do this, if climate change goes forward. So there is a real need for, um, uh, a commitment uh, and leadership from the global south on sustainability, again, broadly, um, where I think there's a lot of opportunities for the developing world, uh, but also with regard to climate change in particular. And I think what I am seeing is that developing uh, country leaders, particularly those who are coming to this from a younger generation, um, have no interest in the old, what I would call 20th century model uh, of trade as a pathway to development, really built on uh, the sort of development strategies of the uh, 1970s, 80s, where the focus was on driving economic growth with a sense that you would catch up with the environmental issues after you've reached uh, a more advanced stage of development. But I think that is not seen by many as the aspiration today. So I do think um, it's fundamental to get the developing world on board, uh, to have Global South, again, not just participate in, but lead this conversation in some important ways but I am actually optimistic that that kind of leadership is emerging. Thank you, Dan, Olim, and then Hamid. Yes, sorry, thank you. Let me just uh, 
reopenness. No, I, I just wanted to just give you an update. I think since uh, it was mentioned, I think by Lou about the uh, the three ministerial initiatives, and I, I think you're dealing with a changing landscape here. I, I think even though yes, there could be more developing countries, but there are already a good number of developing countries who are actually in these initiatives. Uh, currently, there's about I think 89 members in total. Uh, in in the TESD structured discussion initiative, I think it's about 85 in plastics uh, and something like 49 or so in fossil fuel subsidy reform. And if you look at the composition of the members who are joining, it, it's not so stark. It's not so much like developed only or large develop only. Uh, you have actually quite a number of LDCs who are in, in these initiatives who have co-sponsored it. Uh, you also have large developing countries, uh, China and Brazil is also uh, among some of these co-sponsors. You've got middle income developing countries, uh, you've got developed countries. So it's a much more mixed landscape than, than one of developed on one side and global south, so to speak, on, on the other. Uh, you can look at the initiative like plastics, which is a very interesting one. It's not really a in my, when I first saw it and first understood it from the members, it is not your traditional trade type issue. It's more uh, of this sort of new generation of uh, a dialogue about how to deal with an environmental problem. That was actually launched by developing countries, if I could say, uh, with, uh, uh, at the time it was uh, a few SIDS, Barbados in particular, um, China, uh, some of the small countries like Costa Rica, and it's really grown in terms of the um, the, the countries involved. So all, all I'm saying is that, yes, there are, of course, still a lot of uh, important uh, discussions between develop, developing, um, some of the usual divides, of course, are still there. But it's much more complex than that today and complex in a, I would say, in a positive way, that you've got more countries involved who do see this as part of their interests and wanting to do something at WTO. Then the last point I would say that uh, although it's very modest, um, the MC12 outcome document uh, uh, actually does have language on climate change, which I say is very modest because it took uh, a very long time to get there. For many people outside of WTO, it would seem very strange. Why was it so difficult to have uh, a reference to climate change? But nevertheless, uh, it is there. Uh, and it also points uh, towards the the system uh, recognizing and doing more in this direction. And, and that's the multilateral outcome document. So it was mainly just to provide these, these updates. Thank you. Thank you very much. Quite encouraging. Hamid. Well, thank you, Alex. And uh, thank you for the uh, excellent presentations by Dan, Joel, uh, 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 Jenny, and, and Ho, of course. Uh, I, I like very much what, what Ho said about the, the sort of three stages of uh, talking about trade or environment, and then trade and environment, and then trade for environment. The, the, it, it is true, actually, historically, that it has been this kind of evolution in terms of how do we perceive the interaction between trade uh, with the sort of traditional objectives of facilitating cross-border and cross-jurisdictional trade uh, and and the regulatory uh, agenda of different types. Now, it, that links very much to what, uh, what uh, Joel said about when he started saying, what are the parameters for such negotiations on trade and environment? And I think this is key. Because the clarity of purpose for the negotiations, I think, would help a lot advance um, the, any any kind of, of negotiations. And here we we come to some realities. And I would like you know the speakers to to see to confirm whether my perception is correct. Historically, there has always been this sort of tension between uh, facilitating cross-border trade on on the one side and Reconciling that with the regulatory agenda, uh, we we have seen this throughout the years. Uh, whether it's about standards for goods or whether it's about uh, health requirements for agriculture products, and uh, and this is why we have instruments like the TPT and and the SPS. Now 
the, the, the reality behind that is that trade agreements are not for setting standards for those areas of regulations. The, the trade agreements are not designed for that, nor are they equipped to do that, nor would anyone would like them to set standards. Uh, and here, let, let's put uh, the trips to one side. That's a, that's a, a, a very uh, different creature within the system. But generally, the objective of trade negotiations in reconciling trade liberalization with, with uh, regulation has been aimed at ensuring least trade restrictiveness of regulatory approaches. And the way to ensure that was through promoting internationally agreed standards elsewhere, not within trade negotiations. Um, yeah, again, this is like the TBT and, and the SPS. Now, uh, policy coherence is key. And I think it was as well or, uh, who, who referred to that. The, the coherence between what the WTO would do and other organizations. Uh, and, and, and of course, again, Dan is right that when we look at these negotiations, we have to go beyond the kind of traditional tariff negotiations, which are very transactional in nature. This, this is different. But the point here that I'm, I, I would like the speakers to, to, to comment on is whether this kind of conceptual you know, uh, framework of trying to negotiate uh, trade disciplines that would uh, help promote uh, environment policies, but at the same time, uh, make sure that, that, that regulations in, in the environment trade, in, in the environment space does not actually uh, end up being uh, instruments for, um, for protectionism. Uh, of course, there is the other side of the debate, which is the obvious side of promoting trading goods and trading services to contribute to, um, to, to other aspects of the agenda. But it's this interface between liberalization and regulation that I think is, is, is sort of turning around in my mind. Thank you. I'm sorry for the, the extensive uh, description of, of a simple question. No, very helpful to have that. Let me just add a quick thought, and then I apologize for having to jump off, but we'll be glad to have uh, Joel and uh, Janiv continue the conversation. Um, I think that one of the things that's interesting as uh, some of these sustainability issues come into sharper focus, and I would say this of sustainable agriculture in particular, that there's a growing sense that the developing world has actual advantages uh, in being able to produce products more sustainably. And uh, as a result, I think there's a, a number of countries that are actually quite excited about bringing this uh, agenda to the fore. And I'll just give you one example. It's quite clear that uh, in the European market for flowers, uh, Kenya or Colombia actually have uh, real advantages because they grow flowers in a much more natural setting than perhaps the Netherlands does uh, in greenhouses. So that if one is looking at... Um, uh, who should really have competitive opportunity, uh, it would be those developing countries. And I think there's a growing sense that the uh, the way rules are put together need to respect that. And, uh, you know, the details are going to be complicated. This is a, a big conversation, but it is one that I think is the dynamics that might have been perceived in the past uh, to have this become an obstacle to developing countries is at least in some circumstances turned around now in being seen as an opportunity uh, for those in the global south to find better uh, market access as a result of how the 21st century system is going to be set up. So I just close by again thanking all of you who've signed on today. Uh, I'm learning a lot. We have much more uh, in our project to learn from all of you, and I hope the conversation we start today will not be the end of it. Uh, and uh, we would love to engage you in an ongoing basis in uh, gathering your thoughts and guidance uh, on this question of how one uh, moves to a, a, a trading system that's got sustainability embedded at its foundation uh, and really seen as a fit for purpose structure for the 21st century. So thank you and uh, uh, onward, onward to the next conversation. Thank you very much, Dan, and good luck. And let's keep in touch. Joel, your turn. Um, well, thanks, Hamid, for that, uh, that very useful question. And uh, I, th I think it's been an evolution from 
disciplining discrimination to the TBT and SBS that added proportionality and reference to outside standards to um, you know the, this moment where um, it's not enough in, in my judgment to have um, international standards that are not protectionist. Th those international standards have to be designed uh, in part to preserve trade in areas like cybersecurity or, or digital, but but also in, in carbon border adjustment. So so I, I think it was well said um, earlier by, by Dan and by Ho, uh, it's trade for environment, but but not trade totally subordinated and lost uh, because trade has has values too. So I think as uh, standards are developed in this area as international regulation, which I think is is more and more necessary in this area is done, uh, we need an integrated policy process that looks at commerce as well as prudential types of regulation. I think I think your question, prompts that and, and suggests thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, who else would like to take the floor? I see that Daniela Benavente has asked a question in the chat. I don't know if she would like to uh, ask the question personally, but I know what I think I know what the answer is, but I can give it to her later since I'm married to her. So I don't know if anyone wants to pick up the question. Hi, Alejandro. Sorry, I lost uh, the connection for a little while. Um, I guess you're still referring to Hamid's question, is that right? Um, uh, I'm, I'm referring that? to the, the question that Daniela Benavente put in the chat. Ah, okay, okay. Um, maybe I can just do both. I, I also, unfortunately, because it's Trade and Environment Week here, WTO may have to sign off uh, shortly. Uh, but very quickly on Hamid, um, you know, of course, I never disagree with my former boss, so, you know, I you know, wouldn't disagree with his perspectives. Uh, and I, I don't disagree, actually. And, and I think that but what, what I was going to say was that this it is an example of how trade can work for the environment without... Um, in any way disturbing the actual architecture of what trade agreements do. I mean, to give a very simple point is that um, uh, TBT, because the trade environment also covers TBT, um, the the whole effort of uh, getting more alignment towards international standards is something that is, is good for trade, is also good for the environment. Um, an example would be in the area of decarbonization standards, uh, in the steel sector, we know there's a big proliferation right now of uh, of efforts um, to come up with new standards, new measurements, uh, very complex, different scopes of emissions. Uh, we had a chance to speak to some industry players about this. Um, they're quite concerned about what all of this means. They say there's something like 20 different schemes going on out there. Uh, most of this are not easily verifiable in terms of uh, how the measurements are done, they're not easily compared either. Um, and the view is that uh, leaving trade aside, that is not very good for decarbonization efforts uh, in itself uh, in, in the steel sector. Uh, and then the question, can trade do anything about this? Um, one, I mean, it's perhaps not the only answer, but one answer is, well, we already have certain instruments, like, as you said, I mean, the TBT agreement. And TBT agreement has principles that call for greater alignment to international standards. Some some would even say it's a requirement. Um, and it has within it also principles for which you would uh, align to international standards. And these principles um, make sense, whether you're thinking about it for trade or whether you're thinking about it for climate, because it leads to less fragmentation. Uh, if there's less fragmentation, there's more possibility to scale up decarbonization efforts. Uh, and so, therefore, it is one example of how a, a, a trade agreement uh, could uh, be useful for, in this case, climate-related measures, even though it's not actually designed for it. Um, there's still another question, of course, if people want to go further, which is to ask the question, are there any gaps? You know, could there be things that could be done better? But even before getting to, to gaps, you know, simply the recognition that you do have a, a possibilities here to use, uh, in this case, TBT agreement, 
to solve some of the problems that might exist without necessarily jumping to try to create a completely new instrument. Um, and then the other point was simply transparency. They basically said that they find it difficult to know what's going on because many measures are being taken. Uh, WTO mechanism uh, is one, is not perfect, of course, uh, for transparency. Under the environmental database, we have uh, over 10,000 measures that are captured in this database, which goes over all measures uh, notified to WTO. Uh, and it's one way to generate more transparency on notifications because the environmental database takes one step further. It's not just a repository of notifications. It actually uh, takes the notifications and classifies them according to which agreement they come under and under which objective. Uh, and that sort of added sort of uh, value that we hope at least provide added value can help some of this uh, uh, proliferation of many standards. And, and I think this is also helpful for the climate people, uh, not necessarily just for the trade people. Let me stop there. Uh, I think somebody already tried to reply to Daniela. Uh, my very quick, very quick ans answer to that is that where most of the lawyers that I've spoken to basically say that uh, from a WTO perspective, what is important is to think about the um, environmental uh, objective behind the measure. And if the case of border carbon adjustment, the environmental objective is leakage, carbon leakage, as distinct from competitiveness. So the more the measure is about dealing with an environmental objective, uh, the more, I wouldn't, I don't want to say whether it's justified or not justified, but I would just say that it would get uh, better understanding if it was really linked to a, a environmental objective and the carbon leakage problem. So let me stop with that. Thank you. Thank you. And I would add to that, too. So that remark of uh, Hodib, uh, it would also it helps also thinking in terms of how to level the playing field when you think of all these taxes and carbon order just in mechanism. But Joel, would you like to elaborate on the, the reply you, you gave to Daniela on this? Because I, I think it's a very important issue that we have to face today. Well, as Daniela suggested, it's it's the question of the legality of carbon border adjustments. And uh, there is a little bit of uncertainty as to uh, even if they're even handed, which which I believe they must be, uh, even if they're even handed, um, whether they might violate uh, Article 2 or Article 3 of GATT uh, because they're taxes on the production process. So it's, it's a little bit of a, an old chestnut in WTO law. And then even if there's a violation, it could be saved. On, and this is what Ho was speaking of. It could be saved under the uh, Article 20G or Article 20B, the uh, conservation of natural resources or uh, public health uh, exceptions. But uh, there, if it's designed uh, for uh, level playing fields for competitiveness, as, as host suggested, instead of uh, exclusively for environmental protection, it, it could run into problems under the the lead-in or, or the chapeau to Article 20. So it's a it's a tough design issue, and uh, there's a lot of uncertainty. Uh, maybe it makes sense to go forward uh, with an even hand and clean heart and uh, see what happens in litigation. Thank you very much. Any further questions? So I see no no one wanting to take the floor. Daniela, why don't you speak up? Okay. Do you hear me? I'm not sure this works. And I have yeah, plenty of people around. Ah, okay. <laughs> not just to say you know, I have this couple of questions. I, have, I just put another one because this is becoming very, very concrete for all of us here at the ministries. I, I started a collaboration with the Ministry of the Environment only this uh, month. Um, and this is because we're having a fiscal reform uh, at the end of tax reform, if you wish, at the end of the, of the year. And, uh, and we have all these questions and, and, and 
we're really not knowing how to how to deal about this. Uh, we don't know the legality of this. We don't know how to deal about the competitiveness issues and and about the market uh, for carbon offsets, uh, for example, for which we already have a law, and it's gonna be institutionalized in February. So just for you guys to know that this is very very concrete and and urgent, and we need some guidance. Thank you very much. I think it's a very good illustration of the urgency of this matter and uh, how the problem's now in the hands of, of governments and it's uh, something very present. I think at least in Chile and, and, and I suppose that in many other administrations around the world. Any further comments? Well, it seems to be none. Uh, maybe just to say, Alejandro, I mean, it's not really an, an, a full answer as such, but just to say that there are discussions going on at WTO, which I, I believe the delegations who are attending this call probably already know. Uh, but one, one of, the, of the discussions is in the working group on um, trade-related climate measures under the uh, Trade and Environmental Sustainability Structure Discussions. That working group would be one place, I mean, for at least uh, a discussion of a very technical type about these questions on carbon pricing, uh, BCAs, uh, carbon standards, uh, you know, carbon offsets. Uh, it's all very complex, you know, um, and there are different ways to look at it. You have the whole system under the UN UNFCCC uh, regime, which doesn't speak about WTO or trade agreements. Uh, there's a question about whether that regime is at all uh, covered by WTO or not. And then you've got the WTO regime that doesn't speak at all about uh, Article 6 or carbon markets or offsets in the UNFCCC. So I'm not surprised that, Daniela, there's many questions and there's many uncertainties because the institutions currently are in, in that way right now. Uh, they, they both have their own discussions going on. Um, it's not for me to say whether that can be bridged or not, but certainly a few opportunities there, in at least in the WTO process, to, to talk a bit about this. Um, and, yeah, and then to the extent that the Secretariat can be helpful, we, all, of course, will be happy to do so um, and can do it very informally. Um, but, again, our knowledge will also be a little bit limited, but, you know, of course, we're happy to help. Thank you. Thank you very much. I see that Marcel wants to take the floor, but you have to teach me how to pronounce your last name. Yeah, it's fair knowing, but Marcel is just fine. <laughs> yeah. Well, Thanks. thank you. This is this is quite quite enriching. I think it's also important to look a bit more into the the business perspective on this integration of trade and environment. And um, interesting, one of the previous speakers um, opposed. Uh, the development of uh, horticulture products in, in Kenya and other countries against what's happening in the Netherlands. And actually, that's, that's not the way of putting this in a proper perspective because it were actually large companies moving to uh, to Kenya and other countries to work together with local partners in establishing opportunities for uh, for the flower sector there and at the same time uh, reducing the uh, the area of uh, horticulture production, in this case, in the roses in the Netherlands. And this is illustrative, I think, for, for what we're discussing here. So so what are our trade opportunities? What are trade partnerships bringing to the table in terms of uh, of trade and the environment? And I think there are so we can also take into account that things are moving in the business sector. Originally, of course, most companies seeing uh, the environmental issue as something that they had to comply with because, you know, there were rules and regulations, so they were not allowed to do harm, so to say, to the environment. And, and gradually, of course, we've seen the business sector moving into the opportunities of doing good. Um, saving energy, of course, within their own company is, is, is profitable to them, uh, more efficient use of water and so on corporate social responsibility and I think we're now moving into the at least for for not all but for many companies in, in an existential question how they can not only do good but be good not only as a company themselves but in the whole value chain and 
I think it's interesting to talk to to those companies uh, who Lim has been referring to the, the steel sector. Perhaps that's not the most easy sector to talk with, but if you look at the way that small companies uh, see uh, the opportunities for uh, for green trade, and also the International Trade Center, for example, has uh, has asked that in their green competitiveness outlook last year. It's intriguing. Many of the smaller companies see a new market evolving if they if they're able to not only deliver goods uh, and services in a way of uh, not doing harm, but truly being good in terms of their operations and business models. So, so perhaps um, this is also a way to prevent uh, juxtaposition because we see some of our developing uh, economy partners already, you know creating suspicion that you know, we want to impose uh, these issues because we want to conquer their market in terms of environmental goods and services. But we should really try to look at the opportunities that companies in the South also see in, in doing so. But uh, perhaps also just to echo what Liam said, I think that these dialogues are ongoing and we can only reinforce opportunities for um, for partners partnerships around the world. It's, it's more uh, common than, than a question. I'm sorry about that. Uh, uh, but, but thanks again for the, uh, the session. Thank you very much, Russell. I think it's very enlightening what you have just said. And perhaps sometime in the near future, we can have a more focused dialogue uh, and, and bring more uh, more views from the private sector to the table and to see what's happening. But until then, perhaps uh, there is someone here present who... Uh, represents the uh, private sector. Bill, would you like to say something? Bill Reich. No. No. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, I had I had you on. Okay. No, I'm afraid I don't have any comments right now. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. Maybe maybe I can jump in very briefly. I, I think Marcel, yeah. it's it's a it's a very important set of points. One that, uh, of course, trade uh, in in proper circumstances leads to efficiency, which hopefully means less use of resources and uh, and investment in more efficient producers like Kenya or the cotton producing countries is uh, is a good thing for the environment. Hopefully. Um, the second is that, uh, you know, you, you've suggested that corporate ESG efforts might be harnessed to or directed by what I've termed WTO ESG efforts uh, with business, uh, you know, sometimes acting autonomously, sometimes acting in anticipation of regulatory change. And that anticipation could take the form of something like the, the Brussels effect, where um, if you have a, a high regulation state or entity, um, businesses start to uh, design their products or design their production processes for that. And uh, as they do that, it becomes less costly for them to make changes in, in other markets and they can accept higher standards in other markets. So that, that's a phenomenon that we've observed and, and probably something that we can harness uh, with the right kind of, of strategy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anything else? Okay. Well, uh, since we have no further remarks, I think we can bring this session to a close. I realize that many of you are Geneva based and, and quite busy at this present time, particularly in the trade and environment week. So once again, thank you very much to Dan and Janice who left earlier and to Joel and Ho Lim for their remarks. And, uh, and the points that are being raised, I think we have a, a wide agenda before us. And uh, as friends of multilateral system, we will be following up on these issues and trying to uh, promote further dialogue and, and to seek uh, better international cooperation in this matter of great urgency. Lou, would you like to say something? 
thank you, uh, Alejandro. Just a quick word on uh, FMG. Uh, in the next few weeks, uh, we're going to organize further uh, uh, sessions on, on other issues on the dietary reform. So there's one planned uh, later this month on, on the uh, MS-12 uh, uh, agreement on SBS and how that could uh, relate to what we have discussed about to strengthen the regular uh, WTO uh, committee or council uh, bodies. And then we are going to also, also organize another session next month on, on investment facilitation, uh, and also one on uh, uh, what we call trade policy review on Brazil and Miss Miss and so on and so forth. Uh, so, forth. so please uh, remain uh, tuned. So we will send out the invitations uh, very soon. And with that, and thanks again for the whole panel and also all the participants. And we look forward to see you next time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.